Book Two, Part One of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Book Two. Chapter One. After the death of Brutus, his three sons succeed him in the kingdom. During these transactions, Brutus had by his wife Ignoge three famous sons, whose names were Locrin, Arbanact, and Camber. These, after their father's death, which happened in the twenty-fourth year after his arrival, buried him in the city which he had built. And then, having divided the kingdom of Britain among them, retired each to his government. Locrin, the eldest, possessed the middle part of the island, called afterwards from his name Lurgria. Camber had that part which lies beyond the River Severn, now called Wales, but which was for a long time called Cambria, and hence that people still call themselves in their British tongue Cambri. Albanact, the younger brother, possessed the country he called Albania, now Scotland. After they had a long time reigned in peace together, Humber, King of the Huns, arrived in Albania, and having killed Albanact in battle, forced his people to fly to Locrin for protection. Chapter 2 Locrin, having routed Humber, falls in love with Estraldis. Locrin, at hearing this news, joined his brother Camber, and went with the whole strength of the kingdom to meet the king of the Huns, near the river now called Humber, where he gave him battle, and put him to the rout. Humber made towards the river in his flight, and was drowned in it, on account of which it has since borne his name. Locrin, after the victory, bestowed the plunder of the enemy upon his own men, reserving for himself the gold and the silver which he found in the ships, together with three virgins of admirable beauty, whereof one was the daughter of a king in Germany, whom with the other two Humber had forcibly brought away with him, after he had ruined their country. Her name was Estraldis, and her beauty such as was hardly to be matched. No ivory, or new-fallen snow, no lily could exceed the whiteness of her skin. Locrin, smitten with love, would have gladly married her, at which Corinius was extremely incensed, on account of the engagement which Locrin had entered into with him to marry his daughter. Chapter 3 Corinius resents the affront put upon his daughter. He went, therefore, to the king, and wielding a battle-axe in his right hand, vented his rage against him in these words, Do you thus reward me, Locrin, for the many wounds which I have suffered under your father's command in his wars with strange nations, that you must slight my daughter, and debase yourself to marry a barbarian? while there is strength in this right hand that has been destructive to so many giants upon the Tyrrhenian coasts, I will never put up with this affront. And repeating this again and again with a loud voice, he shook his battle-axe as if he was going to strike him, till the friends of both interposed. And after they had appeased Corinius, obliged Locrin to perform his agreement. Chapter 4 Locrin at last marries Gwendolina, the daughter of Corinius. 
Locrin, therefore married Corinius's daughter, named Gwendolina, yet still retained his love for Estraldis, for whom he made apartments underground, in which he entertained her, and caused her to be honourably attended. For he was resolved, at least, to carry on a private amour with her, since he could not live with her openly for fear of Corinius. In this matter he concealed her, and made frequent visits to her for seven years together, without the privity of any but his most intimate domestics, and all under a pretense of performing some secret sacrifices to his gods, by which he imposed on the credulity of everybody. In the meantime, Estraldis became with child, and was delivered of a most beautiful daughter, whom she named Saber. Gwendolina was also with child, and she brought forth a son, who was named Madden, and put under the care of his grandfather Corinius to be educated. Chapter 5 Locrin is killed. Estraldis and Saber are thrown into a river. But in process of time, when Corinius was dead, Locrin divorced Gwendolina, and advanced Estraldis to be queen. Gwendolina, provoked beyond measure at this, retired into Cornwall, where she assembled together all the forces of that kingdom, and began to raise disturbances against Locrin. At last both armies joined battle near the river Stour, where Locrin was killed by the shot of an arrow. After his death, Gwendolina took upon her the government of the whole kingdom, retaining her father's furious spirit. For she commanded Estraldis and her daughter Saber to be thrown into the river, now called the Severn, and published an edict through all Britain that the river should bear the damsel's name, hoping by this to perpetuate her memory, and by that the infamy of her husband so that to this day the river is called in the British tongue Sabrun, which by the corruption of the same is, in another language, Sabrina. Chapter 6 Gwendolina delivers up the kingdom to Madden, her son, after whom succeeds Menprichius. Gwendolina reigned fifteen years after the death of Locrin, who had reigned ten, and then advanced her son Madden, whom she saw now at maturity, to the throne, contenting herself with the country of Cornwall for the remainder of her life. At this time Samuel the prophet governed in Judea. Silvius Aeneas was yet living, and Homer was esteemed a famous orator and poet. Madden, now in possession of the crown, had by his wife two sons, Menprichius and Malim, and ruled the kingdom in peace and with care forty years. As soon as he was dead, the two brothers quarrelled for the kingdom, each being ambitious of the sovereignty of the whole island. Menprichius, impatient to attain his ends, enters into treaty with Malim, under colour of making a composition with him, and, having formed a conspiracy, murdered him in the assembly where their ambassadors were met. By these means he obtained the dominion of the whole island, over which he exercised such tyranny that he left scarcely a noble man alive in it, and either by violence or treachery oppressed every one that he apprehended might be likely to succeed him, pursuing his hatred to his whole race. He also deserted his own wife, by whom he had a noble youth named Abraucus, and addicted himself to sodomy, preferring unnatural lust to the pleasures of the conjugal state. At last, in the twentieth year of his reign, while he was hunting, he retired from his company into a valley, where he was surrounded by a great multitude of ravenous wolves, and devoured by them in a horrible manner. Then did Saul reign in Judea, and Eurystheus in Lacedaemonia. 
Chapter 7 Ebraucus, the successor of Menprichius, conquers the Gauls, and builds the towns Caer Ebrauc, etc. Menprichius being dead, Ebraucus, his son, a man of great stature and wonderful strength, took upon him the government of Britain, which he held forty years. He was the first after Brutus who invaded Gaul with a fleet, and distressed its provinces by killing their men and laying waste their cities. And, having by these means enriched himself with an infinite quantity of gold and silver, he returned victorious. After this, he built a city on the other side of the Humber, which, from his own name, he called Cara Brauch, that is, the city of Abraucus, about the time that David reigned in Judea, and Silvius Latinus in Italy, and that Gad, Nathan, and Asaph prophesied in Israel. He also built the city of Aklad towards Albany, and the town of Mount Agnid, called at this time the Castle of Maidens, or the Mountain of Sorrow. Chapter 8 Erbraucus's twenty sons go to Germany, and his thirty daughters to Silvius Alba in Italy. This prince had twenty sons and thirty daughters by twenty wives, and with great valour governed the kingdom of Britain sixty years. The names of his sons were Brutus, surnamed Greenshield, Margadud, Sicilius, Regin, Morivid, Bladud, Lagon, Bodloan, Kincar, Spaden, Gaul, Darden, Eldad, Ivor, Gangu, Hector, Kerin, Rudd, Aserach, Buell. The names of his daughters were Gloini, Ignoni, Udas, Gwenliam, Gordid, Angharad, Gwendolo, Tangustal, Gorgon, Medlan, Methahel, Urar, Malior, Cambreda, Regan, Gale, Ekab, Nest, Choin, Stattard, Gladdard, Ebron, Blagan, Abelac, Angais, Galais, the most celebrated beauty at that time in Britain or Gaul, Edra, Anaur, Stadile, Egron. All these daughters their father sent into Italy to Silvius Alba, who reigned after Silvius Latinus where they were married among the Trojan nobility, the Latin and Sabine women refusing to associate with them. But the sons, under the conduct of their brother Assaracus, departed in a fleet to Germany, and having, with the assistance of Silvius Alba, subdued the people there, obtained that kingdom. Chapter 9 after Abraucus reigns Brutus, his son. After him, Leal. And after Leal, Hudibras. But Brutus, surnamed Greenshield, stayed with his father, whom he succeeded in the government, and reigned twelve years. After him reigned Leal, his son, a peaceable, and just prince, who, enjoying a prosperous reign, built in the north of Britain a city called by his name, Carlisle, at the same time that Solomon began to build the temple of Jerusalem, and the queen of Sheba came to hear his wisdom. At which time also Silvius Epitus succeeded his father Alba in Italy. Leo reigned twenty-five years, but towards the latter end of his life grew more remiss in his government. 
so that his neglect of affairs speedily occasioned a civil dissension in the kingdom. After him reigned his son Hudibras, thirty-nine years, and composed the civil dissension among his people. He built Caerlem or Canterbury, Caerguen or Winchester, and the town of Mount Palador, now Shaftesbury. At this place an eagle spoke while the wall of the town was being built. And indeed I would have transmitted the speech to posterity had I thought it true as the rest of the history. At this time reigned Capis, the son of Epitus, and Haggai, Amos, Joel, and Azariah were prophets in Israel. End of Book Two, Part One Book Two, Part Two, of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Chapter 10. Bladed succeeds Hudibras in the kingdom, and practices magical operations. Next succeeded Bladed, his son, and reigned twenty years. He built Carbardus, now Bath, and made hot baths in it for the benefit of the public which he dedicated to the goddess Minerva, in whose temple he kept fires that never went out, nor consumed to ashes, but as soon as they began to decay, were turned into balls of stone. About this time the prophet Elias prayed that it might not rain upon earth, and it did not rain for three years and six months. This prince was a very ingenious man, and taught necromancy in his kingdom. Nor did he leave off pursuing his magical operations, till he attempted to fly to the upper region of the air, with wings which he had prepared, and fell down upon the temple of Apollo in the city of Trinovantum, where he was dashed to pieces. Chapter 11 Lear, the son of Bladad, having no son, divides his kingdom among his daughters. After this unhappy fate of Bladed, Lear, his son, was advanced to the throne, and nobly governed his country sixty years. He built upon the river Saw a city, called in the British tongue Caer Lear, in the Saxon Lear Sester. He was without male issue, but had three daughters, whose names were Gonorilla, Regau and Cordiella, of whom he was dotingly fond, but especially of his youngest, Cordiella. When he began to grow old, he had thoughts of dividing his kingdom among them, and of bestowing them on such husbands as were fit to be advanced to the government with them. But to make trial who was worthy to have the best part of his kingdom, he went to each of them to ask which of them loved him most. The question being proposed, Gonorilla, the eldest, made answer, that she called heaven to witness she loved him more than her own soul. The father replied, Since you have preferred my declining age before your own life, I will marry you, my dearest daughter, to whomever you shall make choice of, and give you the third part of my kingdom. Then Regau, the second daughter, willing, after the example of her sister, to prevail upon her father's good nature, answered with an oath that she could not otherwise express her thoughts, but that she loved him above all creatures. The credulous father, upon this, made her the same promise that he did to her eldest sister, that is, the choice of her husband, 
with the third part of his kingdom. But Cordiella, the youngest, understanding how easily he was satisfied with the flattering expressions of her sisters, was desirous to make trial of his affection after a different manner. My father, said she, is there any daughter that can love her father more than duty requires? In my opinion, whoever pretends to it must disguise her real sentiments under the veil of flattery. I have always loved you as a father, nor do I yet depart from my purposed duty, and if you insist to have something more extorted from me, hear now the greatness of my affection, which I always bear you, and take this for a short answer to all your questions. Look how much you have, so much is your value, and so much do I love you. The father, supposing that she spoke this out of the abundance of her heart, was highly provoked, and immediately replied, Since you have so far despised my old age, as not to think me worthy the love that your sisters express for me, you shall have from me the like regard, and shall be excluded from any share with your sisters in my kingdom. Notwithstanding, I do not say, but that since you are my daughter, I will marry you to some foreigner, if fortune offers you any such husband, but will never, I do assure you, make it my business to procure as honourable a match for you as for your sisters. Because, though I have hitherto loved you more than them, you have in requital thought me less worthy of your affection than they. And, without further delay, after consultation with his nobility, he bestowed his two other daughters upon the dukes of Cornwall and Albania, with half the island at present, but after his death the inheritance of the whole monarchy of Britain. It happened after this that Agonippus, king of the Franks, having heard the fame of Cordelia's beauty, forthwith sent his ambassadors to the king to demand her in marriage. The father, retaining yet his anger towards her, made answer that he was very willing to bestow his daughter, but without either money or territories, because he had already given away his kingdom with all his treasure to his eldest daughters, Gonorilla and Regau. When this was told Agonippus, he, being very much in love with the lady, sent again to King Lear to tell him that he had money and territories enough, as he possessed the third part of Gaul, and desired no more than his daughter only, that he might have heirs by her. At last the match was concluded, and Cordiella was sent to Gaul, and married to Agonippus. Chapter 12 Lear, finding the ingratitude of his two eldest daughters, betakes himself to his youngest, Cordiella, in Gaul. A long time after this, when Leah came to be infirm through old age, the two dukes, on whom he had bestowed Britain with his two daughters, fostered an insurrection against him, and deprived him of his kingdom, and of all regal authority which he had hitherto exercised with great power and glory. At length, by mutual agreement, Maglaunus, king of Albania, one of his sons-in-law, was to allow him a maintenance of his own house, together with sixty soldiers, who were to be kept for state. After two years' stay with his son-in-law, his daughter Gonorilla grudged the number of his men, who began to upbraid the ministers of the court with their scanty allowance, and having spoken to her husband about it, gave orders that the number of her father's followers should be reduced to thirty, and the rest discharged. The father, resenting this treatment, left Maglaunus, and went to Henwinus, Duke of Cornwall, to whom he had married his daughter Regau. Here he met with an honourable reception, but before the year was at an end, a quarrel happened between the two families, which raised Regau's indignation, so that she commanded her father to discharge all his attendants but five, and to be contented with their service. 
this second affliction was insupportable to him, and made him return again to his former daughter, with hopes that the misery of his condition might move her in some sentiments of filial pity, and that he, with his family, might find a subsistence with her. But she, not forgetting her resentment, swore by the gods he should not stay with her, unless he would dismiss his retinue, and be content with the attendance of one man, and with bitter reproaches told him how ill his desire of vainglorious pomp suited his age and poverty. When he found that she was by no means to be prevailed upon, he was at last forced to comply, and dismissing the rest, to take up with one man only. But by this time he began to reflect more sensibly with himself upon the grandeur from which he had fallen, and the miserable state to which he was now reduced, and to enter upon thoughts of going beyond the sea to his youngest daughter. Yet he doubted whether he should be able to move her commiseration, because, as was related above, he had treated her so unworthily. However, disdaining to bear any longer such base usage, he took ship for Gaul. In his passage he observed that he had only the third place given him among the princes that were with him in the ship, at which, with deep sighs and tears, he burst forth into the following complaint. O oh, irreversible decrees of the fates, that never swerve from your stated course! Why did you ever advance me to an unstable felicity, since the punishment of lost happiness is greater than the sense of present misery? The remembrance of the time when vast numbers of men obsequiously attended me in the taking of cities and wasting the enemy's countries more deeply pierces my heart than the view of my present calamity, which has exposed me to the derision of those who were formerly prostrate at my feet. Oh, the enmity of fortune! Shall I ever again see the day when I may be able to reward those according to their deserts who have forsaken me in my distress? How true was thy answer, Cordiella, when I asked thee concerning thy love to me? As much as you have, so much is your value, and so much do I love you. While I had anything to give, they valued me, being friends not to me but to my gifts. They loved me then, but they loved my gifts much more. When my gifts ceased, my friends vanished. But with what face shall I presume to see you, my dearest daughter, since in my anger I married you upon worse terms than your sisters, who, after all the mighty favours they have received from me, suffer me to be in banishment and poverty. As he was lamenting his condition in these and the like expressions, he arrived at Caritia, where his daughter was, and waited before the city while he sent a messenger to inform her of the misery that he was fallen into, and to desire her relief for a father who suffered both hunger and nakedness. Cordiella was startled at the news, and wept bitterly, and with tears asked how many men her father had with him. The messenger answered, he had none but one man, who had been his armour-bearer, and was staying with him without the town. Then she took what money she thought might be sufficient, and gave it to the messenger, with orders to carry her father to another city, and there give out that he was sick, and to provide for him bathing, clothes, and all other nourishment. She likewise gave orders that he should take into his service forty men, well clothed and accoutred, and that when all things were thus prepared, he should notify his arrival to King Agonippus and his daughter. The messenger quickly returning, carried Leah to another city, and there kept him concealed, till he had done everything that Cordiella had commanded. Chapter 13 He is very honourably received by Cordiella and the King of Gaul. As soon as he was provided with his royal apparel, ornaments and retinue, 
he sent word to Agonippus and his daughter that he was driven out of his kingdom of Britain by his sons-in-law, and was come to them to procure their assistance for recovering his dominions. Upon which they, attended with their chief ministers of state and the nobility of the kingdom, went out to meet him, and received him honourably, and gave into his management the whole power of Gaul, since such time as he should be restored to his former dignity. Chapter 14 Leah, being restored to the kingdom by the help of his son-in-law and Cordilla, dies. In the meantime, Agonippus sent officers over all Gaul to raise an army, to restore his father-in-law to his kingdom of Britain. Which done, Leah returned to Britain with his son and daughter, and the forces which they had raised, where he fought with his sons-in-law and routed them. Having thus reduced the whole kingdom to his power, he died in the third year after. Agonippus also died, and Cordilla, obtaining the government of the kingdom, buried her father in a certain vault, which she ordered to be made for him under the river Saw, in Leicester, and which had been built originally under the ground to the honour of the god Janus. And here all the workmen of the city, upon the anniversary solemnity of that festival, used to begin their yearly labours. Chapter 15 Cordilla, being imprisoned, kills herself. Margan, aspiring to the whole kingdom, is killed by Cunidagius. After a peaceable procession of the government for five years, Cordilla began to meet with disturbances from the sons of her sisters, being both young men of great spirit, whereof one named Margan was born to Maglaunus, and the other named Cunidagius to Henuinus. These, after the death of their fathers, succeeding them in their dukedoms, were incensed to see Britain subject to a woman, and raised forces in order to raise a rebellion against the Queen. Nor would they desist from hostilities till, after a general waste of their countries and several battles fought, they at last took her and put her in prison, where for grief at the loss of her kingdom she killed herself. After this they divided the island between them, of which the part that reaches from the north side of the Humber to Caithness fell to Margan, the other part from the same river westward was Cunidagius's share. At the end of two years, some restless spirits that took pleasure in the troubles of the nation had access to Margan and inspired him with vain conceits, by representing to him how mean and disgraceful it was for him not to govern the whole island which was due his right by birth. Stirred up with these and the like suggestions, he marched with an army through Cunidagius's country and began to burn all before him. The war thus breaking out, he was met by Cunidagius with all his forces, who attacked Margan, killing no small number of his men, and putting him to flight, pursued him from one province to another, till at last he killed him in a town in Cambria, which, since his death, has been by the country people called Margan to this day. After the victory, Cunidagius gained the monarchy of the whole island, which he governed gloriously for three and thirty years. At this time flourished the prophets Isaiah and Hosea, and Rome was built upon the eleventh of the calendar of May by the two brothers Romulus and Remus. Chapter 16 The Successors of Cunidagius in the Kingdom Ferrex is killed by his brother Porrex, in a dispute for the government. At last Cunidagius dying was succeeded by his son Rivallo, a fortunate youth who diligently applied himself to the affairs of the government. In his time it rained blood three days together, and there fell vast swarms of flies followed by a great mortality among the people. After him succeeded Gurgustius his son, after him Sicilius, after him Jago, the nephew of Gagustius. After him, Kinmarchus, the son of Sicilius. 
after him Gorbagudo, who had two sons, Ferrox and Porrox. When their father grew old, they began to quarrel about the succession. But Porrox, who was the most ambitious of the two, forms a design of killing his brother by treachery, which the other discovering escaped and passed over into Gaul. There he procured aid from Suard, king of the Franks, with which he returned and made war upon his brother. Coming to an engagement, Ferrex was killed, and all his forces cut to pieces. When their mother, whose name was Wyden, came to be informed of her son's death, she fell into a great rage, and conceived a mortal hatred against the survivor. For she had a greater affection for the deceased than for him, so that nothing else would appease her indignation for his death than her revenging it upon her surviving son. She took therefore her opportunity while he was asleep, fell upon him, and with the assistance of her women tore him to pieces. From that time a long civil war oppressed the people, and the island became divided under the power of five kings, who mutually harassed each other. Chapter 17 Dunwallo Molmutius gains the sceptre of Britain, from whom came the Molmutine laws. At length arose a youth of great spirit named Dunwallo Molmutius, who was the son of Cloten, king of Cornwall, and excelled all the kings of Britain in valour and gracefulness of person. When his father was dead, he was no sooner possessed of the government of that country that he made war against Imna, king of Lurgris, and killed him in battle. Hereupon Rudaucus, king of Cambria, and Staterius, king of Albania, had a meeting, wherein they formed an alliance together, and marched thence with their armies into Dunwallow's country, to destroy all before them. Dunwallow met them with thirty thousand men, and gave them battle. And when a great part of the day was spent in the fight, and the victory yet dubious, he drew off six hundred of his bravest men, and commanded them to put on the armour of the enemies that were slain, as he himself also did, throwing aside his own. Thus accoutred, he marched up with speed to the enemy's ranks, as if he were of their party, and approaching the very place where Rodaucus and Staterius were, commanded his men to fall upon them. In this assault the two kings were killed, and many others with them. But Dunwallo Molmutius, fearing lest in this disguise his own men might fall upon him, returned with his companions to put off the enemy's armour, and take his own again, and then encouraged them to renew the assault, which they did with great vigour, and in a short time got the victory by dispersing and putting flight to the enemy. From hence he marched into the enemy's countries, destroyed their towns and cities, and reduced the people under his obedience. When he had made an entire reduction of the whole island, he prepared himself a crown of gold, and restored the kingdom to its ancient state. This prince established what Britons call the Malmatine Laws, which are famous among the English to this day. In these, among other things, of which St. Gildas wrote a long time after, he enacted that the temples of the gods, as also cities, should have the privilege of giving sanctuary and protection to any fugitive or criminal that should flee to them from his enemy. He likewise enacted that the ways leading to those temples and cities, as also husbandmen's ploughs, should be allowed the same privilege. So that in his day the murders and cruelties committed by robbers were prevented, and everybody passed safe without any violence offered him. At last, after a reign of forty years spent in these and other acts of government, he died, and was buried in the city of Trinovantum, near the Temple of Concord, which he himself built, when he first established his laws. End of Book Two, Part Two